Good day, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, is that you? Were you one of those children that was always upside down? I was. I don't know how I learned to turn cartwheels or do somersaults. It seemed to come naturally to me. And I love doing it. I think there's a photo somewhere of me turning a cartwheel when I'm nine months pregnant with one of my children. And that's what I was thinking about with the topic of today's talk being balance. Because the tumbling part came easily to me, but the balance part didn't. And I tried. I really wanted to hold a handstand. I spent hours kicking up against a wall and just trying to find that perfect point of balance. I had it all wrong, and I didn't know that until I actually learned how to teach gymnastics. Because I'm a parent. What parents do is we teach our children all the skills that we can. And then we send them to school so that professionals can do a proper job. <laughs> but we're parents, so we help out. And that means that you'll find us coaching soccer clubs, teaching violin, or running robotics groups. And so I learned to teach gymnastics properly. And I learned that balance is an act. It's an action. It's dynamic. You have to use your muscles, and you have to fight against gravity. You have to push up to stay in balance. That was an epiphany for me. Balance was not a place. It was an action. And what does this have to do with robots, you say? Well, balance and robots, my favorite things. On the one hand, we have an astronaut. On the other hand, we have Robonaut. Now, Robonaut is currently on the International Space Station, helping astronauts with manipulation tasks. Basically, it's a helping hand with a robot head. And there are probably going to be several Robonauts on the new Gateway Space Station. And that's the space station that's going to be orbiting the moon in the next couple of years, permanently. Now, we have to send robots to space because it's pretty dangerous and there's a lot of work that needs to be done that we can't have humans permanently in space doing. But we are now starting to send humans back to the moon. And this means that robots and humans are going to be working very closely together. And that brings up a really big problem. We're humans, biological creatures, prone to a lot of biases and unconscious impulses. We anthropomorphize everything. So if something looks like a human, we just unconsciously assume that it will behave like a human, that it has the capabilities of a human. The reality is, robots are the closest things to aliens that I am ever going to meet. And that's what's really fascinating about them, too. Because on the one hand, the study of humans is how we learn to build robots. And on the other hand, as we build robots, we learn more and more about how little we actually know about humans operate. Vision is still a mystery to us. We don't know why humans sleep or how to turn it on and off. We don't know a lot about the conscious, or the unconscious, or the emotions. All of these mysteries help inform building robots. But just because they look like us doesn't mean that they really have any deep resemblance. This is something called Moravec's paradox. It says that Basically, the hard things are easy for robots, and the easy things are hard. It is comparatively simple for computers or robots to perform at an above adult level in intelligence tasks, like chess or checkers or Go or Jeopardy. But it is difficult to impossible for them to do the sort of perception and mobility tasks that a one-year-old can do. In fact, if you try to reverse engineer 
skills, the hardest thing for robotics, roboticists to do, is to try to build up the unconscious skills that humans have. Those skills have been honed by millennia of evolution. We certainly cannot translate that to robotics yet. In fact, robots have a lot of trouble opening doors. Perhaps some of you have seen this amazing blooper reel from the DARPA Robotics Challenge in 2015. Now, the robots <laughs> were asked to do eight tasks, eight human tasks that would be useful in a disaster response situation. And in fact, it was modeled <laughs> on the Fukushima nuclear reactor meltdown. They had to drive a car, they had to get out of a car, they had to open a door, climb stairs, clamber over wreckage, turn on a power switch, turn off a shut-off valve. They had to operate power tools without cutting off their own arm. <laughs> These are skills that we don't put on our resumes. <laughs> now, what is actually most amazing is that some of the robots were able to complete all eight tasks in one hour. They did succeed, eventually. But one of the stories about this is robots are not very reliable or robust. When they fell over, people had to come and pick them up. Although Chimp from Carnegie Mellon that we just saw that has the tracks, not legs, when it fell over, it was able to pick itself up once. But what this says to me is that there are a lot of jobs that robots aren't going to take from people. Picking robots up, for example. <laughs> that is a totally new job category. <laughs> so maybe it's because I'm Australian, or maybe it's because of all those cartwheels, but I'm used to looking at the world upside down. And in fact, that's my problem-solving technique. I turn the problem upside down, or back to front. I flip it. Now, the problem that people bring to me all the time is how will we solve the problems that robotics and AI are going to cause? And I guess I get asked that because I'm the managing director of Silicon Valley Robotics, which is the largest cluster of innovative robotics companies in the world. And robotics is moving from research into the real world. In 2010, there was next to no investment in robotics. But in 2019, there was $30 billion. So I have the benefit of having a ringside seat in what's really happening in robotics and what is just a super cool video of a robot turning somersaults. And so I like to flip the problem and say, Let's not talk about the problem with robots. Let's talk about what are the problems that robots and AI can solve for us. Let's get robotics working on our grand challenges. And our big challenges are providing enough food for everybody, reversing illness and aging, protecting the environment. And these are all things that I see robotics companies making small strides in. Things like precision agriculture, urban farming, uh, local just-in-time manufacturing and recycling. There are soft robot exoskeletons. It's actually called powered clothing. And this can help the elderly stay in homes, their homes, for longer. And it can also reduce injuries in the workplace. Now, these are businesses that are just, just getting started this year, last year in the next decade to come. Robotics is at its early, early stages. So I don't fear a robopocalypse. I actually worry that we do not have enough robots to do the things that industry is asking for help with. Industry doesn't want robots to replace humans. Frankly, robots are not cheaper. It, they need robots because there is no workforce in many, many jobs. We need robots 
not just to fill the workforce needs today, but to do better jobs, to improve productivity, and to remove people from the dull, dirty, and dangerous jobs that no person should have to do. Humans are great at social and creative roles. We should let robots take care of the rest. Now, that's my big worry. How do we get enough robots into the world to solve the world's problems? And to continue the space theme, this is the most, photo, most reproduced photograph in the world. And it was the first photograph from space taken by an astronaut on the Apollo 17 lunar mission, the first photograph to show the whole Earth. It's the most copied photograph in the world. It's beautiful. It gives us a new perspective. But has anybody noticed? It's actually upside down. That's Antarctica at the top. <laughs> uh, maybe you see the reversed version. But that is the message I want to leave you with. Practice upside down thinking. Reverse the problem. To achieve balance, we have to take action. So I learned robotics because I knew that that was going to be the most important problem that we had to solve in the future. With robotics, hopefully we can solve a lot of our problems, but we don't have enough people building robots. So my challenge to you is, everybody here, learn robotics. OK? Don't let the kids have all the fun. <laughs> because it is fun. But it doesn't mean that you have to build them or program them. It can mean that you build businesses that leverage the best things that robots can do. And that's how we can put robots to work to build a better, balanced planet. Thank you. <laughs>